Hi. I can't tell you how uh, it worked. We're very fortunate today to be able to talk with Naomi Shiab Nye, uh, a wonderful uh, force of the state of Texas that needs a wonderful force. Uh, I have met her when she had published one book called Hugging the Jukebox and uh, was reading from that. It was just wonderful. And I, I've seen her uh, giving lectures on kindness to mental health workers. Uh, she's published uh, or been part of publishing 18 books of poetry. Is that many? Um, well, I'm not very good at counting. Okay, we'll, we'll say that, but it, it does include Hugging the Jukebox, 19 Varieties of Gazelle, uh, Castaway. Uh, what are you working on now? I have two books coming out. One I co-edited with the wonderful writer Marion Winnick, and it is um, a beautiful edition of the writings of Anne Alejandro, who lived in Uvalde. Uh, Texas. And we uh, considered Anne one of our favorite writers. She um, she died about four years ago, five years ago. And so we've been working on the book ever since. And it will be coming out hopefully next year from Texas A&M University Press. And then also I have turned in a book of poems about moms. Um, not sure if the title is still in question. Um, inspired by my own mother and having been a mother and um, and other mothers, just mothers in the world. Are, are you retired from being a mother? Is that what you're saying? Having been a mother? No, you're still well, a mother. You're always a mother yeah. um, I'm a grandmother now. Oh, dear. Yeah. I'm an that's, active grandmother. Yes. That's that's a great thing. Okay. Uh, let us let us do our amicus briefs questions. What is your favorite place to read a poem? You know, anywhere. I was thinking about this question. I will read a poem on an airplane, in a grocery line. Uh, at my desk, of course, is a peaceful place for me. And uh, I have read poems in hotel rooms over the years, so many, everywhere. Uh, I think one of the great aspects of poetry is it's so portable and the poems can go with us. Cool. What was the first poem you remember getting? Well, I fell in love with poems when I was three and I heard my mother reading Emily Dickinson to me before bed, but I wouldn't say I really got those poems. I just loved their melodious language and the way an image would float and not be explained. But the first poem I really remember thinking about grasping in full was a poem by Rachel Field that I read in second grade. And Rachel Field was a very popular novelist for girls of the time, but she also wrote poems. And the poem, Some People, uh, I, I could recite it for you. Would you like me to? Of course. Okay. Isn't it strange some people make you feel so tired inside? Your thoughts begin to shrivel up like leaves, all brown and dry. But when you're with some other ones, it's stranger still to find your thoughts as thick as fireflies, all shiny in your mind. A rhyming poem, it was in the anthology called Favorite Poems Old and New. I still have my copy of that book. But um, I remember thinking, I understand exactly what she is talking about. And it's nothing that anyone has ever spoken about in conversation. But that feeling already that there would be some people you could talk to forever and others who would make your own thoughts feel dried up and empty and inexpressive was already known to me. So it was very thrilling to think that a poem in such a compact little shape could express something big that you might be thinking about for the rest of your life. Uh, if you could ask any question of a writer in the past or an artist in the past, who would it be and what would you ask them? Well, I would really like to hang out with Jack Kerouac and um, 
we shared a birthday and um, I got to be friends with his last wife after he died. But I would just like to talk to him um, and ask him, what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Jack, and, Jack, Jack Kerouac, the person, Jack Kerouac, the writer. Both, both Jack Kerouac, oh, okay. the writer, Jack Kerouac, and the person. I mean, I really loved a novel of his that was so unlike the books, which became super popular, like um, On the Road and The Dharma yeah. Bums and Desolation Angels. But I loved an earlier book of his called The Town and the Country, which was a, a much more classic form of novel. And you know, I, talking to his wife also and corresponding with her for years, um, we became quite dear friends. And I think it was a question she thought about and wondered about what would Jack do differently um, if he could. And, you know, I have my own theories what he would do differently, uh, but I would just love to, to talk to him. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, what do you think contemporary writing gets right and what do you think it misses well what i love about contemporary writing is that it's so various dom there's so many styles so many topics um every time i read one of the poem a day sites you know i discover a new voice somebody i i, I hadn't been familiar with and um frequently the poem will be written in a format with a strategy i've never thought about using myself and i'm it's just so thrilling that so much is is going on with uh, contemporary writers. Um, what what poetry misses, you know, I, I think people really need to have mentors. And um, I, I want there always to be a sense of, like, who were your mentors or who were the people who, who guided your own life as a writer, as a human. And sometimes I feel sort of lonely for that. And also, I mean, I'm sure people have mentors. I just often have to really try to search or, or figure out who they, they are. And even when I talk to my own students, sometimes it's hard to figure out, well, who who really is mattering to you? And so I, I just feel like that's quite important. And maybe that was more important to, to poets in the past to have those those mentors and to and to pay homage to them. I mean, I feel like somebody like William Merwin for his whole life was talking about his own mentors and that it's something worth doing to help other people, but but also to to remember those voices. Um, I really don't like this whole, whole thing of people getting so upset if somebody uses a word you didn't like in a poem or you don't favor and whatever people want to call it, um, whatever kind of culture it is, you know, I feel like if you don't like the language in these poems, don't read them. Read somebody else. Why are you so becoming so inflamed over it? You know, just let people write in all kinds of different ways. And um, and there should be that, that freedom. I mean, I get really upset when things that seem important to me in the world, like endless massacres of Palestinians and Gazas, Gazan people never make it on the front page in the kind of way of grief that say, you know, civilians in Ukraine dying or in Mau on Maui dying, that those people are honored, but the people of, of certain places in the world are not honored. So that makes me really upset, but it doesn't mean I stop reading the news entirely because of it. Um, I do feel, and maybe I'm just feeling very sensitive about this at the moment because of some things that have been going on in the San Antonio literary community, but I just feel like if you don't like someone's work or it offended you, but turn your head away and read some other person whom you favor. So I, I don't understand where this thought came from that we all have to, that everybody has to be pleased by everything. That makes no sense to me. Um, yeah, I, I, can, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and, and of course, I'm very antagonistic about book banning. And um, having just attended the other day a wonderful poetry reading in the small community of Mason, Texas, 
I was simply the inter introducer, but the great poet Glover Davis was reading. He lives in Mason now. And just meeting the community, the wonderful people there, and hearing some of them talk about how upset they are uh, about not their own town uh, trying to take books out of the li school libraries, but other towns in Texas. You know, I got into that discussion with them and um, it just seems so like, are, are people trying to go back to live in caves? All of, what's going on here? It, 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 so that's it, upsetting. It's a very uh, intriguing and alarming phenomenon of uh, devaluing books entirely. Yes, uh, yes. The is. Houston Independent School District is closing uh, middle school uh, and elementary school libraries, high school libraries. And, and that is so upsetting to me. I've been yeah. writing on all kind of news sources where you can put your opinions up there. How outrageous that is when the librarians are the heart of the school. And right. they're like the central switchboard. I feel like my life was guided by my elementary school library. And, and, um, yeah, that, that's an outrage. Writers, so writers are not receiving a certain kind of respect or the variety of voices that I would hope that the United States, this free country, would be proud to have. Yeah. Um, that's very disturbing. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate that passion. Speaking of which, I'm looking at, at your background. Here's the question. If you had to get rid of all of your books, except what would fit in a cardboard box, what's going to be in the cardboard box? I would keep William Stafford, all of his books, or most of them that I have. I would keep W.S. Merwin. I would keep Lucille Clifton, Mahmoud Darwish, um, Jane Hirschfield. The Nusha Lamaris. Um, I would keep the beautiful anthologies made by the young poet James Cruz, just because they're so heartening. And if I had to get rid of all my books, I'm sure I'd be depressed. So I would want to have some heartening books in that box. Um, but these are some voices that have sustained me a long time. Emily Dickinson, of course, my first beloved um, poet. And uh, so, ma so many others, of course, but if it was a small box, you know. Yeah, we understand. Okay, well, here's uh, another abstract one. What, what makes something art? Well, well, I think love and care make art. Um, you know, you can see when someone has crafted a, a gate tie, for example. I live in an old inner city neighborhood in San Antonio, and when I'm walking around picking up trash, you know, I'll look at someone's yard and I'll think, that's an artful way to close your gate, or um, look at those stones stacked in my yard. Someone stacked them with, with care and attention. That's art. Um, you know, I'd say that I have very wide latitude of of what art is and of course it's all the things we think of as art you know all the visual arts and performing arts and written arts but also it can be the simple movements of a day you know the grace with which someone lives how someone folds towels and puts them away could be very artful okay. i've been reading a terrific book dom I just okay. love it so much by Dorothea Tanning called Between Lives. And it's, she's looking at her life as an artist, as a poet, and the wife of the great German artist Max Ernst. And she's also looking at a lot of their friends who were artists. And she's also looking at a, almost 100 years of time. Because I think this book came out when she was in her late 80s. And she lived to be past 100. So um, it's, it's just an incredible book about, you know, the ways they lived in the early 20th century as artists, such as their lives, but art was the central part of every day. And how they would make a dinner out of, you know, sort of as Edward Weston used to do with school avocado on the plate. And um, so just reading the book feels like an experience of, of tremendous participation in, in art through someone else's story. So, um, yeah. And 
I think whenever we're really you know, sad, bereft, gloomy, to participate or confused, overwhelmed, to participate in anything that in any small way feels artful to us uh, can be a tremendous help to the spirit. Okay, if uh, what poem would you read to your father? Well, I love that question because I would read any poem to my father. I miss him so much. He was so funny and such a great listener. And he was a writer himself in two languages. So he really cared about, about writing. But right now, I think I would read him this poem from a book called The Trees Witness Everything by Victoria Chang. And she was reading at the Round Top Poetry Festival, where I most recently saw you, Dom. So it's appropriate. And, and I, I uh, got this book there for then. So, uh, and I, I love Victoria's work. I, I just love it. But I picked this one out to read to my father. I think he would like it. Lives of the Artists. I brush my hair and wonder if you're watching. I write a word and attach it to a speaker. Someone please listen. Words come out of my coffin made of maple. When empty, it will return to the trees to speak to no one. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for all of your work, uh, all, all the wonderful poems, all the help, uh, all the, the kindnesses you have. Uh, Thank you, Dom. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I am a big fan of Houston, so it's an honor to speak to you there and be part of this series. And I appreciate everything you do for, for poetry always. Well, thanks. And I guess good, good night for now. Take care. Bye. Bye.